Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Comic-Con panel, Exploring Our Origins with NASA. My name is Anthony Rapp. I am an actor, but I do play a scientist on a little TV show called Star Trek Discovery, and I'm a big science nerd myself, a science fiction aficionado. So it's I was incredibly honored and thrilled to be given this opportunity to talk about these important and amazing and mind-boggling facts and notions and ideas and etc with these esteemed scientists uh first up we have dr john mather and then uh, next up we have dr ann nguyen and then we have dr laura kerber and then last but certainly not least we have dr allegra legrand So uh, the title is a pretty ambitious title. It's exploring our origins. And I think we mean not only, well, I think we mean the origins of our species, but also the origins of our planet, maybe even the origins of our solar system, maybe even the origins of our galaxy, and maybe even universe, since we're talking about the Big Bang. So I think going back, if, the, if you call that the original origin, so to speak, uh, Dr. Mather, John, if you would be so kind as to, I don't know, if you were like standing in front of people who knew like this much about the Big Bang, what would be the first things that you would share with us about that? Oh my goodness. Well, I would say, well, we see everything running away from us uh, at immense speed. And if you try to run the movie backwards in your mind, you get back to where it was all crushed together. And we call that the Big Bang. So that's a um, pretty big surprise. We got that surprise back in 1929 and we've been working at all the details ever since. And what were the what were the initial things that led to that breakthrough idea being discovered or well would you would it be would you call it a discovery or a distinction or how would you describe it? It was a discovery. So uh, Edwin Hubble drew us a little graph of the same guy we named the telescope for and his graph said here's all these galaxies we can see. Uh, and you know a galaxy is made of a 100 billion stars held together by gravity and you know what, they're almost all running away from us with immense speeds. So he said, by the way, the speed is proportional to distance. So you see this paddle and pattern and you say, well, what's that about? You divide the distance by the speed of each galaxy, you get the age of the universe. So he got the wrong answer. It was 2 billion for him. It's actually 14 billion. <laughs> uh, but that was the first time we ever had a clue that the universe had an age. So it was it, geometric. It, it, and how do you how do you get from two billion to fourteen billion? What was the what was the indication that that number? Okay, well, the, his uh, his measurements of the distance were wrong because he used what we call the standard candle method. So if I have a star that flashes like this, and I have another one farther away that flashes, and I, and they flash the same way, I say must, they must be the same. But he got mm -hmm. fooled because the kind that's farther away was a different kind. So. So he got the wrong distance scale. So we had it took us a long time to fix that. But anyway, that's where we got the Big Bang not from this uh, galaxies running away from us. I, I hear you. I, I want to go back. So I'm sorry, when you say it was a different kind that because so therefore it might be brighter or, or it might be yeah. bigger and different. Yeah. So it has different luminosity or whatever or lumens, yeah. is I think the word. Yeah. So there were two different kinds of stars. They flashed at the same rate. But one of them was uh, about 50 times brighter than the other. So he didn't know that. Very, very cool. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to ask a question of all of you sort of generally, since this is a Comic-Con panel. Um, and I think that people are very grateful who are interested in science to get the opportunity to have sort of more layman conversations than, you know, like if we sat, if I imagine myself sitting at a, conference at a NASA convention, I might, I feel like my, my, I would try, but it would be probably hard to, with some of the nomenclature that you use. So twisting it back on you, are you, do you find it um, interesting or exciting for yourselves as scientists who traffic in that world to then be able to have a more layman conversation in a venue like Comic-Con? Well, I would say from my perspective, it, it really uh, allows me to broaden what I think about as my area of expertise and then also uh, what I think about more generally because I find the audience will ask what seems like a simple question but turns out to be very profound. And if you're kind of myopically focused on whatever your very specific thing that you're studying is, 
you lose sight of the broader picture. And it, and to me, it really brings it right back to what's broadly important. Cool. Thank you. I'm sorry, you're going to say, Anne? Yeah, I, I have the same feelings. Um, a lot of times, you know, like I'm in the lab studying these small particles and you get really stuck in the small little details that you a lot of times amazingly forget the broader picture. And it's, you know, especially like when you're talking to children, the next generation of possible scientists, they ask these questions that you take for granted, but then it makes you think about everything in a, in a new, in a new way and kind of look at your data over again. Do you have any, is there like an example you might think of like of a specific thing that a child asked you in particular that made you go, oh yeah, you know, I know I'm putting you on the spot by making you try to think of a specific anecdote like that. Um, well, maybe not. So, well, I, I gave a talk recently about the Cyrus Rex asteroid sample return mission to a lot of students. And I asked them questions like, how do you think we would select these sample sites? And the answers that I got back were just, it was amazing. <laughs> now, I mean, not only did they get the right answers, but they got a lot of new answers as like, you know, that is a good way to look for a sample site. So maybe we can use that in the future, you know? Yeah. Do you, so when, when you say you, you send up these little probes or you're part of a team that sends up probes to, to meteorites, is that correct? Can you describe that work a little bit? There was the OSIRIS-REx mission, which you might've heard of. They just recently captured um, material from an asteroid and they recently left that asteroid and are on their way back to Earth. So we should be getting samples in 2023 to look at. So it's very exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and what is the goal for that? Like what, what, what does doing that help us learn about our origins and what's happening in the, in the galaxy and the universe? So we have meteorites and cosmic dust samples that we collect on earth and in the stratosphere. And that's tells us a lot about the solar system, but these samples are, in a way biased and they undergo alteration when they enter the atmosphere, when they're sitting in Antarctica and the ice, they undergo weathering in the, in the desert. So they're not the most pristine samples that we can get. By going out there and actually getting it, these are like the most pristine samples that you can get. And, you know, with the comet return mission, those samples have really really <laughs> given us a lot of surprises. Um, we thought we would find a lot of extrasolar, you know, pre-solar materials, but instead we found a lot of materials that were formed in the inner solar system. So it's like, huh, you know, how did material from the inner solar system get all the way out to the outer solar system to be incorporated in these, in these bodies? So I can't wait for the asteroid return samples because I know we're going to get a lot of surprises there too. So well, I know that, I was, yeah. well, I just wanted to say, I was thinking about sample return and you get a lot of meteorites that come kind of randomly to earth. And, and in some ways it's like, I was thinking it's like meeting a new person and you meet a person and they're very interesting and you learn a lot about them and you kind of get to know them a little bit, but then you, you go to their hometown or you meet their family, which is the equivalent of like going to the actual body that they came from yes. in the solar system. And suddenly you realize like, oh, I see now why you are the way you are. <laughs> Can you differentiate for us a little bit difference between planet, moon, asteroid, comet, and what gives those different designations? Well, comets um, randomly formed are out in the outer solar system like beyond the Kuiper belt. And these are kind of cold, icy bodies. Um, and they don't really get into the inner solar system much. So they don't get heated very high. Um, you know, asteroids are a little closer to home. We also have near earth asteroids that come a little closer, um, like asteroid Bennu, which Osiris Rex sampled. So these comets and asteroids are more primitive they're kind of the leftover material from solar system formation before, you know, they didn't quite make it to the planet formation um, step. Mm -hmm. I'll, let, I'll let us talk about planets. But... Yeah, so sorry, we have kind yeah. of, 
rules about what gets called a planet and what doesn't, which you might be familiar with this sort of controversy over whether Pluto is a planet or yes. not. So Pluto's yes. like way out there, kind of went in the comet zone and it's made of icy material and it's kind of a lot smaller than all the ice giants that come before it. And so in order to be a planet, you have to kind of uh, be in an orbit around the sun, and that's what distinguishes a planet from a natural satellite or a moon that has that's in orbit around some other planet. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to, you know, kind of have a, I think, a mostly circular, like spherical shape, which a lot of asteroids don't hit that criteria because they're a very unusual shape. You kind of have to be big enough to compress yourself into a, a more or less spherical shape, and then you kind of have to clear your orbit of other objects is what they say and so uh, something like Ceres which is actually pretty spherical and actually pretty large um but it's uh, it's in the asteroid belt so you know maybe mm -hmm. that doesn't count but it's it's these kind of rules that we've come up with over time it's not like something that's handed down to us it's just what it, mm -hmm. what do we think is the best classification type so in the case of Pluto we we're kind of happy calling it a planet for a long time um it it does cross Neptune's orbit. So it, you would have to say either Neptune failed to clear its orbit of Pluto or Pluto failed to clear its orbit of Neptune. <laughs> but then we started finding more planets out past Pluto that were very similar mm -hmm. to it, like icy bodies that are pretty big out uh, even further. And you came to a point where you're thinking, okay, either we have to add quite a lot of planets to what we consider the solar system, or we could just say, we have a new category, dwarf planets. We'll put mm -hmm. Ceres, this near, this unusual asteroid in there, we'll put Pluto in there, we'll put these mm -hmm. new planets in there, and then we'll keep our nice, you know, eight planets, and that'll be very neat. So that's where it is right now. When you look back to all this, you know, you talk about the Big Bang where there's whatever cluster of material that was for whatever reason together, and then it started in all these billions of years, it keeps expanding and expanding. At what point, do we, can we recognize that there was any form of what we see as biology on our planet? Like how many years ago in our time on this planet, do we recognize the presence of, of any kind of biology? We know that the biologists have found uh, fossils of things that look they, like they were alive about 3.6 billion years ago. And so we're all billion. wondering, is that yeah. real? You know, is that really yeah. when things started? And, uh, it's, a, it's also around the time we have evidence for oceans and continents mm. zipping around. So that's uh, somebody that knows more should say, but that's clearly something we would like to know about planets around other stars. And we may never find out, but we certainly want to know. And we may never find out in yeah. part because they're so very far away. Is that correct? That it just might yeah. be hard to even... But we, but we do have a point. chance to find out if they have the chemistry of life. Do they have water? Do they have oxygen? Do they have other things that we have here that we think are important? And that's a step. But we're not planning to go there. As far as we yeah. know, we can. It's far. Sometimes we're trying to look for, in, in the atmosphere of other planets, gases that seem to be out of equilibrium. So it's like something must be constantly producing this, otherwise it wouldn't mm. exist and we wouldn't be able to see it. And that's something that they've recently, you know, they kept detecting methane plumes on Mars, or just occasionally there'd be a bit of methane and it'd disappear. And the only way you can really think of that happening is if there's a volcano that just erupts a little methane, or if there's some kind of life form that's putting out methane and then it disappears mm -hmm. and it keeps going. So, so these are the sort of things we look not only throughout our solar system, but also throughout the universe uh, or the uh, planets around other stars and things that we're getting to see better and better every day as our telescopes improve. So I, I did want to say also that uh, one of the main goals of these asteroid and comet return um, missions is to see if, you know, you know, these asteroids and comets, a lot of them are water rich and organic rich. So a big question is, you know, could it be that these are the bodies that brought these materials to Earth to help start life here? I would say that on Earth, you were talking about when did Earth have life? And it's, as we look back through the geologic record, of course, it gets more and more difficult for us to see what's going on because the portion of the Earth's crust from that period is smaller and smaller to the point where mm. the in the oldest rocks we have, we might only have a couple grains of a couple minerals that show us that something was happening at 4.5 billion years ago. But mm -hmm. as soon as mm -hmm. we get enough of a record to see whether or not there is life, there are signs of life. 
And so that's really kind of surprising to us because it means that life came on Earth pretty quickly. As soon as Earth was capable of holding life, it seems like life was there. There it was. Yeah. 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 When you, you mentioned water. And I know that I remember reading a long time ago that, you know, in our exploration of Mars, that there was theory that there might be water, but people were, there was a debate about it. And that, you know, that, that water is always seen as this indicator of the possibility of life. And now it's been, as far as I can understand, it's very well established that there's ice on Mars. Is that, am I correct in that? That, that there's no question, it's unequivocally the, the case. Um, is it the same uh, component, is it H2O? Or is it another form of water? Or is that part of what we're looking at also? Whether or not it's liquid or solid water, that's, that part's important. Yeah, that's uh, but, you know, water on Earth, sometimes the H2Os, the H's can be a little different and the O's can be a little different, but it still behaves mm -hmm. as water. The water yeah, so, we also have um, CO2 ice on Mars. Um, so what sometimes on, the, you look through a telescope at Mars and it has two ice caps on the north and south. Sometimes you can mm -hmm. really see the ice caps quite well. And most of that is water ice. And then sometimes it has a lining, especially in the winter of a big CO2 ice cap. So that's just like dry ice that you might see. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But so how long ago was it? Because I remember, I feel like I've been alive in the time that we didn't think there was water on Mars. And then it felt like this big discovery. Am I mistaken on when that evidence became really known or? Like what the well, breakthroughs we were always were trying to figure out where water was on Mars and how widespread it was. From early times, we knew that Mars had ice caps. And actually, in some of the earliest um, telescopic observations of Mars, the astronomers saw what they thought were kind of lines going crisscrossing the surface of Mars. And they thought, ah, this alien civilization that lives on Mars, it must be running out of water slowly. And so they have to make canals that go all the way from those ice caps down to the equator to feed their dying civilization. That's what they always sure. thought. And so then when we got better pictures, we realized, okay, those aren't actually lines. They're, they just appeared like lines and there are no canals on Mars. But then they're trying to figure out, okay, is there ice anywhere besides the poles? And then is there anywhere where liquid water has been? Is there any time in Martian history when water could have been liquid and not just frozen all the time? And so over time, we figured out, wow, there's lakes and rivers and valleys on Mars. They don't have water in them anymore, but they did. And it used to be really widespread. And then we figured out, wow, the mid latitudes are filled with ice, but it's all buried under the surface. So you can't see it right away. And then if you go even equator word of that, there's a bunch of glaciers. And at first we thought maybe these glaciers are old remnants and they're all dried out. But then we got a radar and we looked in there and they're still full of ice, you know? So as, as everything, as the time continues, the space that water inhabits on Mars kind of grows. And then our understanding of when it could be liquid, both in the current time and going back through history also grows. So we realized, oh, Mars was a planet where a lot of its history was shaped by water. It's not just a planet where like a remnant water cap remains from a dying civilization. So yeah, are there theories about what happened to all that water on Mars and, and where it went and why it went? I mean, Yeah, well, we think that it, we know that it was liquid, it was flowing across the surface, there could have even been oceans on Mars. And now it appears to all generally still be there, but it's just frozen. And so that was a big thing. Like all the people who want to make Mars habitable in the future, they were really hoping that all of the water that used to be on Mars is still there and we could tap into it as a resource. And they were also kind of hoping that maybe there would be more atmosphere that used to be, uh, Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere. And mm -hmm. so that the atmosphere might be locked into minerals somewhere and then you could also release that and terraform mm -hmm. Mars and it would be great and have a civilization. So what we found mostly is the water still seems to be there. There's tons of it, um, but the atmosphere mostly seems to have escaped into space, which is too bad. And what makes a planet's atmosphere escape? Like, why would that happen? Well, <laughs> so like if such you're, a strange thing. It's, it's kind of a balancing effect because the atmosphere is always escaping a little bit and then you're replenishing it with volcanoes. So you have like, volcanoes and like Anne was talking about, you have comets and asteroids that come in and deliver additional atmosphere. And so on Earth, you have the volcano atmosphere factories, and then you have lost space. And then protecting all of the atmosphere is the magnetic field. 
that slows its loss to space. So what we think happened on Mars yeah. is it's a little bit of a small planet. It can't, with its gravity, hold as much at atmosphere as Earth can just naturally. But then it lost its magnetic field at some point. And then the magnetic field wasn't there to shelter it anymore. And the solar wind kind of came along and stripped a lot of the atmosphere away into space. So that's too bad. Yeah. And, and you know, we're, uh, we're thinking about this for planets around other stars too, because it's predicted that, or it's actually measured that most stars have planets. And about 20% of them have planets about the right size and temperature to be sort of like Earth. Uh, but unfortunately for our ideas, it seems that uh, most of them are around little red stars. And those little red stars go blasting away with huge flares of immense amounts of hot material that could come and rip away the atmosphere of a little planet. So we're all wondering, well, what's the competition between what she said about the volcanoes refreshing and the, uh, and the, and the flares ripping things off? So uh, we're going to find out, we hope, in a few years uh, when we get to better look. And in, in our galaxy, is there an approximate number? Like I know you said there were, I think, I think you said 100 billion stars mm -hmm. approximately. Of yeah. those, you think that there's solar systems around all of those stars or most of those stars? Is that what uh, you're saying? Yeah, that's the number. Most, star, most stars have planets. Um, maybe if you're a double star, it's a little dubious. So Tatooine is maybe not right. Um, but <laughs> why, I'm sorry. Why is that? Why? Why? Why well, is the that? Orbit may be, the orbits may be unstable when there are two stars. So that's so the one would challenge. pull a little harder at the other. Yeah, it would be like, yeah, yeah, can you, know, you, you kind of fling the planet out of the system? <laughs> yeah, that's the way you are fling it into the star, which is worse. But at any rate, <laughs> yeah. uh, that also tells us, by the way, there should be lots of planets uh, running around in space with no star. They've just been expelled, and so. Oh. We know they're there. Well, We've seen the evidence of that, and that's kind of fascinating that uh, there are interstellar spaceships called planets, and you can't find them yet. So you mean that they there's nothing for them to orbit around anymore, right? Because their they've stars died, expelled. perhaps, or yeah, yeah or, they've or they've just, just been, they've been kicked out, probably by a bigger planet. Yeah. <laughs> So they're so. just floating there in darkness. If you can imagine if that happened to your planet and your little civilization, okay, it has volcanoes and it still will be a little warm for a while, but then it's getting further and further away from the sun and there's nothing you it's can do get about cold. it. Your civilization yeah. just drops, drifts <laughs> off into space. Um, I, I was surprised that I've, I've learned a little bit more about some of the planets more recently is so I've been reading, um, like Kim Stanley Robinson's work. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but, uh, and I'm always curious, like people like yourselves, if you regard his work as being, you know, grounded in science or not, or, you know, um, but it feels illuminating to me as a layman to read and get some, you know, yeah, some characters and it's all hy hypothetical, whatever, but I feel like I also do learn some tidbits about the, our solar system. Um, and yeah. I was surprised to hear that Mercury is actually colder than Venus. Um, is that true? Yeah, that's true. So on the <laughs> night side of Mercury, it gets down to like negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit. And then on the day side, it's up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. But it just, it has no atmosphere. So it just depends. Oh, it's either freezing cold or it's super hot. But whereas Venus, it's further away, but it has a crazy greenhouse effect of 90 yeah. bars of CO2. And so night or day, Venus is like maybe 860 degrees and can melt lead. And it's just, it's kind of a crazy place. So yeah, Venus ends up being hotter than Mercury, even though that's not what you would originally think. But yeah, the 2312, and then I also read Red Mars. And for me, yes. I think they're amazing because especially Red Mars, as someone who lives more of my time of my day on Mars than on the Earth <laughs> and all the geography and everything, the fact that mm -hmm. Kim Stanley Robinson, he, he really knows a lot of the science and then he gets really into the, the geography. So he says, this person lives here and they put the base there and everything's yeah. kind of spatially oriented properly to one another. And then the events mm. that happen, he's like, oh, this crazy event that happens. And you're like, yeah, that's a real event that happens on Mars. Yeah. Yeah. I found it uh, very, very cool. That's cool. Uh, that, as, as a nerd myself, I, I enjoy hearing that. There's always been this fascination with Mars, right? There's always been a cultural, like we've been drawn to it as sort of like a, almost like a twin or not a twin, but what do you attribute that no, to yeah. when, you're, when you're looking no, at you're right, planetary because, science? Uh, 
uh, Mars is really, even though we call Venus our sister planet because it's very similar to us in size and it's close by and everything, its actual reality on Venus is like a hellscape, you know, it's yes. super hot and it's the bottom of the ocean and everyone first thought, oh, Venus has dense clouds, maybe there's a jungle in there and all this cool mm. stuff and it turns out, no, it's like fire and brimstone only. <laughs> and so then you go to Mars and it's like, okay, the, the size of Mars is about, if you take all the continents of Earth and stick them together, that's about the size of Mars. So mm. livable space, it's actually the same as Earth. And mm -hmm. then as far as its climate goes, it's almost, almost livable. And it's got water and it's got clouds and it's like the most Earth-like climate that we can approach. It's really mm. the best second home of humanity in the solar system. So I think that's why everybody is always thinking about it all the time. So what makes it almost, if it's like poisonous to breathe, what makes it almost? The temperature on Mars, it's, it, you know, it gets kind of cold at night, but then and during the daytime, like sometimes that curiosity is a rover that's roving mm -hmm, around mm -hmm. and it'll be, you know, 70 degrees at really? the crater. Yeah. I'm it's, sorry. It's like kind of a nice temperature. <laughs> Was there's that big, known? There's a big split. Was that uh, known? They knew, yeah, they, they knew generally, I mean, we've learned over time kind of what the temperature of Mars is. It, it, it has a thin atmosphere, so it gets hot during the day and then it gets wicked cold during the night. But as long as you're inside, it's probably fine. You can live on Mars, sort of. And for, the, for those of you who are like, you're looking at these extra, I don't know if you call them extra planetary bodies, is a comet and in a meteor considered extraplanetary, would that be a way to describe it? Is that a good terminology um, or no? Different, different than a planet, they're just different. a body. <laughs> okay. they're, they're above so, the planet, yeah. We call yeah. them small bodies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of them could have resources you would like to have. Yeah. Uh, either precious minerals that are hard to get here on Earth because just whatever formed them happened to concentrate those minerals in those particular asteroids or comets. Uh, or um, a lot of them have water. So if you want to go get water, uh, you could try going to a comet. Now, if you want to go live there, that's a little trickier because there's no gravity practically at all. So you've got to hold yourself down with something or you go yeah. flying off. Uh, but it's uh, it's not a trivial thing to uh, to imagine um, getting resources off of those smaller bodies. That's a, that's a real thing that people are thinking about doing is is okay if if we are on the moon and we've run out of you know the resources there how do we mine the, these materials from you know flyby asteroids and things like that so you you think the the chance of a lunar base is not like feasible because it's too hard oh, to live on the moon i no no i love a lunar base a lunar base is great um they it, the nice thing about the moon is it's close by and it's easy to talk to people on the moon and if you have to bail out of the moon it's you know you can come back home but what I think about, like, and <laughs> we can talk to some of the other panelists about this, but the Earth sometimes has bad things that happen to it that kind of last for, you know, hundreds to millions of years, during which time you wouldn't want to be on the Earth. So if something right. happened that, that made the Earth unlivable for some period of hundreds of years, the moon is a fine place to be. But eventually you'll run out of resources or water or ways to make oxygen or something like that. Yeah. Mars has yeah. a lot more resources. What do you hope for in your in your you know in your research in terms of do you are you eager to try to find examples of other possible life elsewhere? Is that one of the things that animates your research and that you hope for? I think our best chance is um, these kinds of missions that they're doing now. Like uh, right now, we have a rover on Mars called uh, Perseverance, mm -hmm. and Perseverance is taking a bunch of samples, and so we've sent all these laboratories to Mars to say like, oh, let's measure, is there water here? How long was the water liquid? Is it the kind of place that somebody could live? Like, is it habitable? And then we're trying to look for unusual chemicals that are out of equilibrium. But once we actually have the rocks in our hands and in the laboratory, then we can do a lot more detailed analysis and we can say, oh yeah, there's this very subtle chemical equilibrium like you know that he was saying that we can argue about for the rest of our careers <laughs> or we can find a lot more sorts of like specific evidence that would you know be some mm -hmm. kind of smoking gun for life but it's definitely something that everybody's uh really jazzed about the current question that 
we as humans have, right? Is, is there a life elsewhere? Well, let's try to find out. And then also, yeah. how did we get here? Well, let's try to find out. So a lot of what we're doing is kind of trying to figure out, okay, yeah, how did life get to Earth? How, how did we get here? And then, you know, can this happen somewhere else, like on Mars? And um, yeah, the Mars sample return will be very fun when that happens. Absolutely. I think, Allegra, you were about to say something? I'll just say, my research is focused on the climate system. And, you know, one thing about the Earth's climate system is that it's been remarkably stable over hundreds of millions of years. Not to say that we don't have hot times and cold times, but we've had liquid water on Earth for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, probably since the very beginning. And that like magic zone where it's warm enough so that you can have liquid water, but not so hot that you, you have a hellscape like you do on the surface of Venus, that's part of what makes uh, Earth so special. And it's, it's uh, you know, something that I know my, my colleagues who work in exoplanetary uh, biology or think about these things, you're always looking like, can you find other kind of planets in this Goldilocks zone where they're far, just, just far enough away from the sun so they don't uh, uh, burn up and they don't freeze and they have enough mass so they have the right kind of atmosphere that can sustain itself for millennia, you know? That's, it's something really neat to think about, but also a bit mind boggling that Earth is such a, this, is it such a special place or are there many, many other places like it? Um, I have a question about like the, the, my, again, limited knowledge of the, what we think happened, like with the dinosaurs, like a catastrophic, huge um, asteroid crashing into Earth. That's one of the theories where apparently the atmosphere became super, super hot right and and poisonous and then do, do we know how approximately how long it took you said that it, we've had this very stable atmosphere for a long time but it did get really bananas for a while there and then it came back around do we have any sense of how that happened or why that happened that it came back around well life first wasn't totally extinguished some life did persist and um you know part of it of course like there would be the initial fireball that happened but another part is that whatever materials got injected you know some of those materials would have been injected just a little bit up in the atmosphere and then we have rain that can literally scrub these things out and some of that material would have been injected up higher in the atmosphere above the level where we have rains and that could have persisted for a long time and making actually the surface of the planet quite cold um, mm. So I, I, I don't know that number off of the top of my head. Yeah, but it seems like the, the <laughs> systems that were in place helped re-regulate almost. Is that what the theory is? That the, the weather systems that were already part of our atmospheric life on this planet helped kind of make it go back to some sort of new normal after that? Our natural weather systems would have helped clear these things out. The rain would have started scrubbing things out of the atmosphere. Uh, those things would have been deposited into, you know, uh, river, river systems and eventually into the ocean. If it was toxic, eventually those things would have been capped by just normal weathering of other kinds of materials on Earth, and it would have gone back to the way it was kind of before that cataclysm. Um, there was a question that we're, we're nearing the end, um, but there was a question that was proposed that I think is a really fun one, like a little speculative question. Um, like, I don't know if what specific period you would call what you study, if you think about a specific period, or if there is just a general period that you would, if you had a time machine and you could go back and observe and look at and be around for certain events in the, in the, in your fields of study, is there anything in particular that you'd like to go back and see like eyeball and, and eyewitness, uh, anyone, uh, let's start with Anne. Well, my kind of, I study materials that are held with, you know, within asteroids and comets. And a part of that are stardust grains that formed in the atmospheres of evolved stars that are, you know, light years away um, from our own solar system. So, you know, if, by studying these tiny, tiny grains, I learn a lot about, you know, what's going on inside of a star, reactions, mixing, processes, how does the gas in the atmosphere coagulate into dust? Um, what is that atmosphere actually like? What happens in a supernova explosion? So mm -hmm. if I could transport myself somewhere, and that is, you know, all back in time mm -hmm. without being destroyed, then I would, <laughs> I would That's love a big caveat, yes. Yeah, without being destroyed, I would love to see 
what you know the it's kind of the end life you know the death of a star in a way um so what what's going on how does what does it look like what does a supernova explosion look like what does a binary system look like that phase of life is where our sun is going to go so it'll be kind of fun mm -hmm. to see you know what's going on there and kind of see oh well that's going to be kind of our future it could be scary but also fun <laughs> Sure, I understand. Yes. Yeah. So this that's a great question. Um, you know, I, one of the period in Earth's history that I've spent a little time studying is uh, fifty five million years ago. And that point in time is called the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And the Earth was already pretty warm to start with. I mean, carbon dioxide were you know, three four times what they were today, and then all of a sudden it got much much warmer. And you. If you go and look in ocean sediment cores, you see these huge changes in the carbon cycle. You see huge changes in temperature. And we we don't really, really know what caused that huge change. It was already hot, and then all of a sudden it got hotter again. It stayed that way for for a time, and then it came came back. So I, I would like to go back and actually see like what happened to kick off that hot time and what happened to, to reel it back in again. Uh, Laura, what would you say? Uh, well, I recently heard a eulogy of a geologist, and apparently his idea was heaven of heaven was that you could just sit there and take the universe, and then there was like a time bar that you could grab and just move it back and forth and see mm. things changing. So he wanted mm. to, when he died, just sit there and be like, continents forming, continents breaking apart. He studied like mm -hmm. uh, formation of continents. So that's my sure. ideal. But if I had to choose one, just one time, I think um, right now I'm very excited about Perseverance rover being at uh, Jezero Crater. And this crater has used to have a lake in it as a delta. And I just love to see before the transition of Mars from a very nice place with lakes and rivers to a not so nice place. I'd love to see what it was like back then. And uh, yeah. you know, if there's any fish in the lake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weird looking fish, weird looking Martian fish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, to bring us home with this question, John. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to know everything. So all <laughs> the way from the first stars and galaxies that we hope to see with the Webb Telescope to uh, how do the stars and planets grow in the first place? So I just want to take the. Uh, I've gotten more interested in planets than I used to be because we have the chance to learn so much more. So I'd like to see uh, go back in time to where the solar system itself is being born. And I want to sit there for a million years and watch the particles that orbit around and how, how they uh, condense into little bits and then they grow into big bits and then they grow into planets and some are thrown out into space and never come back and some crash into the sun. And uh, it's supposed to be very chaotic and interesting. So I'd like to watch that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Do and. Apropos of that, do we like this? Maybe if this is a stupid question, please forgive me. Do we know the approximate age of our our of our planets? Like how relative they are to one another in our in our solar oh, system? Uh, oh, comparing the planets with each other. Yeah, uh, I think we sort of imagine they were all formed very quickly. Um, we watch a few uh, other solar systems being born uh, as we speak out there with the telescopes we have. There's one. I'm sorry. Our, you're, I'm sorry. You're seeing it right now. I'm sorry. Really? Yeah. There's uh, some you can watch with the telescope called ALMA in the, in South America. It watches the millimeter waves, and you can see the uh, clouds of dust orbiting around the new star, and see uh, little places where we are pretty sure planets are growing. So um, we calculate how fast that goes, and it's only a hundred thousand years or something before it's finished. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Well, I I could sit here just chatting with you guys all day long it's so interesting and i mean we barely scratched the surface of the surface of the surface because after all these surfaces are pretty old and there's lots to them but i hope that uh everybody watching at home has gleaned a little bit of something and so i also encourage anybody watching if you have the chance to visit any of the various nasa centers that have you know public access or tours or any kind of educational programs avail yourself of it the, the scientists that i met there and here today uh, are incredibly inspiring and um you know it's really cool to see that behind all these cool images are these bunch of people just doing work that they're passionate about. Um, it's really, really, really inspiring and very meaningful. So thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank you for letting me nerd out with you. And I wish you all the very best. And I hope you get to find that time machine and go to those places at some point. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Take you care. so much. Yeah. Stay safe.